everybody. Nice to see so many uh, familiar faces. Um, so this is the Camp for Climate Action in 2008. I was 24 years old, um, and I guess if we're thinking, if we think about normal as kind of this paradigm of subversion, this was about as subversive as you could get. Um, it wasn't cool, there wasn't a whole lot of social media, um, and it was hard, pretty awful, heart-wrenching work, and you were always losing, constantly losing. But I had the absolute privilege and pleasure of working with some guns who have gone on to do brilliant, brilliant things. Some of you are probably in the room, um, but as the comms person, or part of the comms team, we used to play this game at the end of the day to keep us sane called uh, Fantasy Front Page. And we'd sit there and we'd been, you know, we'd been spending the whole day like sending out press releases because that's what you did in 2008. And uh, we'd be like, oh, what's your fantasy front page? And I'd be like, well, <sighs> Brad Miller, Melbourne Demon star goal kicker, in case you weren't, in case you know that. Uh, Brad Miller would be on the footy show with Sam Newman and Eddie Maguire, and he'd be kicking the coal habit. And you'd be like, yeah, that's and then Georgie or Holly would be like, yeah, I don't know, cover a Vogue? That'd be pretty hot. And would be like, yeah, yeah, let's, like, we've got to get on to Kirsty Clements. Let's get her. She, she may have back blacklisted us for a while better. Anyway, um, needless to say that none of those fantasy front pages occurred in 2008. But... Not exactly Brad Miller, not AFL, I guess I can be a little bit you know, agnostic about the code. Um, wasn't the right team, but still Collingwood putting their hand up and saying, yeah, we care about this stuff, brilliant. And then Emma Watson, 2018, on the cover of Vogue for the first ever sustainability issue. And the reason I guess I'm pointing this out is because normal is a place that you get to and it's kind of a, a process. It's not something that is ever static. And many of us play different roles in terms of where that paradigm sits and, and how and when and in what ways we choose to be subversive. Um, but this felt really good. Um, it also probably is, gives you an indication of how crappy I am at PR. Like I'm working on a 10 to 15 year lead time, so... Um, <laughs> They got there eventually, but, you know, not when I wanted to. So going from kind of comms and sustainability, um, being a little bit sad, being sick of, sick of losing, I decided instead to just, like, you know, get into parties. Um, many of you have been to a lot of the parties that I've kind of thrown. Many of you have thrown a lot of these parties with me. There were green up parties. Um, there were house parties, bike parties, growing parties, perma blitz parties, naughty parties, fun parties, uh, grow up local parties, big parties. Uh, there was that time where I was in the party party. Um, didn't quite make it <laughs> into the New South Wales Parliament, but anyway. And then there was the Clover Moor party. Um, and the funny thing is, I guess, that I've learned probably more about how to subvert the dominant paradigm and how to create a normal that we can all really enjoy from throwing parties than from pretty much anything else. Um, so this time I, last year, I had my heart set on a real job. That was a surprise to many people. Um, and it was something where, as part of the interview process, they were like, OK, well, um, the, the question was, what does Sydney really need? And, how, and in what way could you contribute to that? And I really, really thought about it. And I said, well, Sydney's full of brilliant visionaries. We're well resourced. We've got all the policies in the world. We've got heaps of reports. We've got all of you. Um, but what we're not always great at is implementation and actually doing the thing. And often it falls down in that part. So as part of my pitch to the think tank that I wanted to work for, I said, you know what, I think what you really need is to be a do tank. Um, so I don't work there. <laughs> Evidently, they probably weren't that keen on that idea. Um, 
But it did kind of start this process of looking around and going, yeah, what would a good do tank look like? Who is smashing it on implementation? And how can I be a part of that? Um, so I met and came across this awesome guy called Ross Harding. Um, this is Ross with his excellent partner, Gabe. And Ross is almost as crazy as I am. Um, so we get along really well, and he loves this party probably more than I do. So we knew that we kind of had a whole bunch of stuff in common. But more than that, Ross is an economist and an engineer, which is amazing. And Ross is the kind of guy who basically has one of those conversations in the pub that says, starts with, what if we? And then him and his mate, Will, not only just like have this conversation at the pub, but then they go and actually do the thing. So they finish the sentence. They go, what if we did the economics of change for a whole city? What kind of investment opportunity would that look like? Um, they did it. They wrote a book. And the answer is, it's like a $200 billion investment opportunity. And that would take, in this case, Melbourne, from being a producer, or, sorry, a consumer of water, a consumer of energy and producer of heaps of waste, and then transforming it into a producer of clean energy, producer of clean water with zero waste. And they did these beautiful diagrams. Um, they did these graphs that you, know, you might find tattooed on the arm of a very cool young person in, in Brunswick. Um, they made it look beautiful. They made it speak the language of money. Um, they worked out who would pay for what and when, which is pretty ambitious. Um, he then pulled together some of Melbus, Melbourne's most ambitious architects and said, OK, well, what would these big transformative projects look like? And the point of this is that, like, I know, having been on council, there's no way in hell that this project would ever get through any kind of development application process. Like, it's not going to happen. But the point is, you've got to start somewhere and you've got to visualise it. So why not? Why not be able to take your food scraps to an anaerobic digester and, in return, get access to an awesome sauna? And why not uh, take all of our water, recycle it, and then co-locate the water recycling treatment plant uh, with a nightclub? Why not? So that was the starting point. They put together all these awesome concepts, and they're like, OK, well, that's kind of big. We've seen lots of pictures. We don't, have, we, we don't need more pictures that are never going to happen. So instead, they transformed these big concepts into small prototypes. So it went big to little. And they took over a building as part of Melbourne Design Week, where people could come and experience these things. And it kind of worked like it would an art exhibition. So there were all these installations, and then they invited property developers, decision makers, architects, investors, whoever, the general public, to come in. And it kind of worked like a sticker thing. So you kind of got to put a red sticker on, on the projects that you liked. And in doing so, it took a big concept like efficient retrofits, um, that is kind of boring. And it said, and it took the concept that Fender Cats leaders came up and said, OK, well, we're just going to wrap buildings in huge blankets, and said, OK, great. But what does that feel like? What's the atmosphere of that concept? And it's like, all right, we'll just get a, an artist to paint a wall and show what that would look like, what that would feel like. How do you engage with that? And then what happened from the prototype is that the prototype was adopted as a project. And so this is a building that exists. It's a triple building that they invested in. Um, it's, it's a very normal looking building. However, it is super duper high performance. Um, this is a building that takes all of those boring, normal things, puts them together into something radical and something that's transformative. It's one of those uh, projects where Everybody talks about it, but if I, and in many situations, were to ask, OK, well, show me three examples of a fully retrofitted building, very few people can actually point to examples. And being able to point to examples is the kicker. So this is a real thing. Uh, not only that, it comes with the figures. Now, the figures are super duper important. If you're trying to persuade anyone to do a thing not, and to actually go from an idea to a concept, you need to come at it with these figures. Um, but with the new normal, this is what really got my attention. Um, of the 10 projects that Ross and his team put up as part of Melbourne Design Week, 
Nine out of the 10 got a sticker, are in planning, are being funded, and three have actually been complete. So I was like, woohoo, yes. Um, I'll have one of those for Sydney. So I talked to Ross and he said, sure, try your best. I'm like, excellent. Um, so we currently have 12 pilot project briefs up on the website, and my job at the moment is to curate 12 teams to respond to all of these. In true form, we started with a party. Everybody came. Uh, it was a small party-ish. Um, but the point of the party is to like, kind of open this invitation to people that you need to persuade from the get-go. So there were architects, there was designers, but more importantly, there were decision makers. Because part of this is really about setting up yeses in a, quite a powerful way. So the 12 project briefs, um, you know, energy efficiency retrofits, net zero, uh, wastewater to energy, a uh, whole lot of stuff in and of themselves, nothing is particularly radical. But when you throw them all together, they become incredibly powerful. And I think that's where normal has the opportunity to subvert not only the dominant paradigm, but create a new paradigm. And I think that's kind of where we want to head. Um, it's a big collaboration. Everyone's invited, so these are some of the collaborators that we've already got on board. Uh, each team is comprised of an asset owner who has a site that they would consider actually doing this thing on because it's not just a creative exercise. Uh, there's an architect or a designer whose job it is to come up with the renders. There's an expert who gets to figure out how things can work better. And there's also a cultural connection who has the job of ensuring that all of this can can be understood and engaged with uh, by the public. Um, it's also about de-risking it for politicians. Having been in that world a little bit, I appreciate how important it is to set up a yes and to do it in a way that's multifaceted and isn't scary for somebody to say yes to. And a lot of the time when you're presenting a report with all the numbers, like you kind of get it in a rational way, but what we really want to create is a feeling and an atmosphere. Um, so it's really about setting up as many golden shovel moments as possible. Um, by June next year, the ambition is to be like, I've got one for you, I've got one for you, I've got one for you, I've got one for you. And I've got a little bit of the policy and the economics behind it so that if it's an absolute failure, it's all my fault. And if it's a huge success, anybody else can take full responsibility for it, especially somebody who's in an election cycle. A little bit tricky, maybe. Is it going to work? I think so. Um, so some of the projects that we've got, I'll give you a bit of a, like a, a sneak preview of what we've got. So. Uh, one of them is taking an entire hospitality group off gas, but you've got to start with one venue. Another one is, what about a circular food court in a major shopping centre? What if we retrofitted all social and affordable housing so tenants have no bills? Uh, what if we could convert all the Camrys, Hiluxes and Land Cruisers in Western Sydney so that the people who actually need an EV can afford to have one? What if there was solar on every roof? We say it as if it's already happening, but you know, it's not. There isn't yet solar panels on every single roof. Uh, what if there was an urban farm on Paddy's Markets? Um, what if we actually started the job of converting the 13 hectares of laneway in the city of Sydney into microgrids that can cool and provide biodiversity benefits? What if there was a garden club at the bottom of every lonely apart apartment block where people can come and pot up their little pots and then also meet their neighbours and provide plants and food for birds? Um, what if we just didn't let any more sewage into the ocean? What if there were net zero plus builds for every build? Um, and then one of the things I'm kind of most excited about is that, and I wasn't aware of this, but there is a heap of really beautifully well-treated wastewater in Sydney that is like all this effort goes into treating it to a point where you could drink it, but we're not allowed to drink it. In cities all over the world, other people do drink it. So what if we use that, Andy, um, and we turned it into a beer, and then we got to call the beer on the piss? <laughs> Why not? 
So really it's about um, you know, bringing together these crazy ideas through culture, through what's cool, through technology, um, and what's real and what can be done. Um, so the ambition is often only limited by our imagination, and we need to offer and create a moment where everybody can connect to that op opportunity. Um, so this is visceral. This is about atmosphere, and the point of doing the prototypes is that people can come and actually see it. When they can see it, they know what to ask for, and they trust that the future isn't as scary as some other people would have you believe. Um, so it's probably a good thing that I completely blew that interview. Um, it's kind of scary doing something that's completely uncharted. Um, I'm not competitive at all, so it's not as if the Sydney version will just be heaps better than the <laughs> Melbourne one, but it probably will. Um, <laughs> but I really love that there are so many ways to express purpose um, and be subversive, but do it in a way that's kind and that's connected and that's generous and, and open. So I guess in a world that feels increasingly myopic and lonely and competitive, and like, well, not, you know, Sydney, Melbourne, but anyway, but competitive and hectic and scary, um, I think maybe one of the most subversive things that we can all do is just show up to the party. Um, and with that said, I think you're all invited. This is going to be great. Um, and if you want to be part of a team, a project, if you want to help make it happen, then you're all invited. Thank you so much, Jeff. What an incredible invitation, everyone. Um, sitting and listening to you talk backstage really reminded me of an amazing quote, one of my favorites. Um, and it's that the job of an artist is to make change feel inevitable. And I think you have that gift in spades. For people who are listening and they are trying to shift their organizations out of think and into do, pulling on your incredibly diverse toolkit, what would be the tip that you would recommend? Just start. <laughs> really, it's, it's, um, I think it, you can often get lost in, I mean, there's a role for planning. Planning is brilliant. There are, there are people who are very good at that. It's, it's not as if you have to be um, reckless, but if the excuse for not starting is that, then we don't really have time to be doing that anymore. I think we just have to get on with it. It doesn't have to be perfect. Happy to be your scapegoat, um, assuming obviously no legal liability. Um, but yeah, I think starting and, and just, you know, being brave. Love that, love that. And your incredible array of projects is just beginning. So I won't ask you for a win yet, but I'm gonna ask you what success looks like in your mind. Yeah, so success is capturing those five million people from all over Sydney who go to Vivid and who, like, in their prams with their little ones and their old ones, stop past and go, oh, what's this? And then they come and walk through this kind of diverse offering of futures that are not so far away, and they go, yeah, this is cool. So I want it to feel like Ikea but without getting lost. <laughs> that is... I want them to go, I want this for me, yeah. I want this for me. What a powerful thing to create for you. Amazing. Thank you so much, Jess. Right. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you.